Did you know one simple physics mistake could sink your vintage boat? Or cost you thousands in fuel? Why does your heavy fishing boat float, but a lighter anchor sinks like a stone? And how do some boats skim over water at 60 miles per hour, while others struggle to move? Today, I'm revealing the secret boat physics every owner must know to save fuel, steer safer, and be the best damn waterman out there. This isn't just for big ship engineers or captains. This is how you will become a better boater. The most fundamental question in boating is deceptively simple. Why do boats float? The answer begins with a naked Greek mathematician running through the streets shouting Eureka. When an object is placed in water, it experiences an upward force equal to the weight of the water it displaces. This is Archimedes' principle, and it's the foundation of why boats float. Think about it this way. When you place a boat in water, it pushes aside a certain volume of water. If the weight of that displaced water is greater than the weight of the boat itself, the boat floats. It's that simple. But here's where it gets interesting. A solid steel ball will sink because its weight is greater than the water it displaces. Yet, we build massive ships out of steel that float perfectly. The secret? It's all about shape and density. I took all my non-boating friends out fishing last summer. They kept asking why we couldn't bring more beer and people, but the boat's so big. I showed them my capacity plate and explained that physics doesn't negotiate. Overload your boat beyond its capacity, and suddenly its weight exceeds the buoyant force keeping it afloat. That's when physics turns against you, and no amount of bailing will save you. So, buoyancy keeps your boat afloat. Displace enough water, stay under capacity, and you'll avoid sinking your vintage gem. Have you ever overloaded your boat or seen one dangerously low in the water? Let me know in the comments after subscribing. Now that we understand why boats float, let's talk about how they move through water, specifically a phenomenon called plowing. We need to understand this before we get to the fun stuff. When you first apply power to your boat from a standstill, the bow rises and the stern squats down. Your boat is now plowing through the water, literally pushing water aside as it moves forward. This creates significant resistance, which is why your boat feels sluggish and you can hear your engine working harder in this phase. Here's a great fact. An engineer named William Froud figured out a way to predict your boat's top speed based on nothing more than its length and gravity. Ever tried pushing your boat past that speed and noticed it just won't go faster? That's physics in action. Every displacement hull has a theoretical maximum speed determined by its waterline length. This is called hull speed, and it's calculated using the formula. Hull speed in knots approximately equals 1.34 times the root of the waterline length in feet. So a 25-foot displacement hull has a top speed of approximately 6.4 knots, or 7.4 miles per hour. Try to push beyond this speed, and something interesting happens. The boat begins creating larger transverse waves. A longer 40-foot vintage cruiser will have a higher hull speed because their extended waterline creates longer waves, reducing drag. But that might not be you and me. For those of us wanting to go faster, there's a solution. But it requires a completely different relationship with the water. But before that, if you want to be liked on the water and borrow your dock neighbor's hose, watch this next segment closely and drop a like before we get started. Don't be that guy. Know what I'm talking about. Every boat moving through water creates a wake, a pattern of waves that spreads out behind the vessel. This wake isn't just a pretty pattern, it's a physical manifestation of energy transfer that has real consequences. When your boat moves, it displaces water. That water has to go somewhere, so it forms waves that radiate outward. At slow speeds, your wake is minimal. As you approach hull speed, your wake grows significantly because more energy is being transferred into wave production rather than forward motion. Why should you care about your wake? First, your wake can cause damage. Large wakes can rock docked boats, potentially causing them to slam against pilings. They can erode shorelines, disturb wildlife habitats, and even capsize smaller vessels like canoes or kayaks. 
I once saw a credit card captain blast through a marina at high speed, creating a massive wake that snapped a mooring line on a docked sailboat. The sailboat hit another vessel, causing thousands in damage, all because someone didn't understand or care about the physics of their wake. Second, you're legally responsible for your wake in most jurisdictions. You're responsible for any damage caused by your wake. This is why you'll see no wake zones in marinas and congested areas. To minimize your wake when necessary, operate below hull speed in sensitive areas. Transition through plowing speed range quickly. Be especially careful when passing smaller vessels. Keep greater distance from anchored or docked boats. Pay attention to posted speed limits and no wake zones. Your wake's a power player. Control it to save fuel, avoid damage, and keep the water friendly. Do you always slow down in no wake zones? Tell us about the best wake etiquette advice you've gotten, or have a vent about those inconsiderate wave monsters in your local channel. So far, we've discussed boats that operate within their hull speed limitations. But what about speedboats that seem to defy physics, skimming across the water at 40, 50, or even 70 miles per hour? These boats aren't breaking the laws of physics, they're using them differently through a phenomenon called planing. Planing occurs when a boat achieves enough speed that it begins to ride on top of the water rather than pushing through it. The hull literally rises up and skims across the surface, dramatically reducing drag and allowing for much higher speeds. For a boat to plane, several factors must align. The hull must be designed for planing, typically with less displacement, that's probably most of us in the community. The boat must have sufficient power to overcome the initial resistance. We're talking Evinrude, not Hang Kai. The weight must be properly distributed. The trim must be correctly adjusted. Trim is the angle of the boat relative to the water's surface, and it's crucial for efficient planing. Too much bow-up trim increases drag and reduces visibility. Too much bow-down trim risks stuffing the bow into waves and could send your passengers flying. I remember teaching my sister to drive my boat a few years back. She couldn't figure out why we kept bouncing uncomfortably across the bay until I showed her the trim button. One small adjustment later and we were gliding smoothly, using 20% less fuel too. It was like magic, but it was just physics. The proper trim angle changes based on conditions. When accelerating from a stop, trim down to help get over the hump into a plane. Once planing, gradually trim up until the bow rises slightly and the boat reaches maximum efficiency. In rough water, trim down slightly to keep the bow cutting through waves. With a tailwind, trim up slightly to prevent the bow from diving. With a headwind, trim down to minimize the effect of wind on the bow. The way you distribute weight on your boat affects virtually every aspect of its performance and safety. This is because weight distribution directly impacts your boat's center of gravity and stability. Every boat has a center of gravity, the point where all of its weight is effectively concentrated. It also has a center of buoyancy, the center point of the underwater volume that provides the upward buoyant force. The relationship between these two points determines your boat's stability. When a boat is at rest, the center of buoyancy is directly below the center of gravity. When the bow heels, tilts to one side, the center of buoyancy shifts towards the submerged side, creating a writing moment that returns the boat to level, assuming the boat is properly loaded. I once watched a group of inexperienced boaters pile all their gear, coolers, and equipment on the top deck of a pontoon boat. The first moderate wave they hit nearly capsized them. They had raised the center of gravity so high that the boat had almost no stability left. Picture climbing a ladder. On the first step, you're all safe, but once you're at the top and reaching for that light bulb, well, you feel a little wobbly. For optimal performance and safety, keep heavy items low in the boat. Distribute weight evenly from side to side. Adjust fore and aft weight distribution based on conditions. Never exceed your boat's maximum capacity rating. Secure all items to prevent shifting in rough conditions. On planing boats, weight distribution is especially critical. Too much weight aft can cause porpoising, an uncomfortable up and down motion. Too much weight forward can make it difficult to get on plane. Even small adjustments in passenger positioning can significantly affect performance. Understanding how to handle your boat in waves is perhaps the most important practical application of boat physics. It's where theory meets reality, often in challenging conditions. 
Waves present several challenges. They can destabilize your vessel, cause uncomfortable motion, slow your progress, and in extreme cases, capsize or swamp your boat. First, recognize that waves come in different patterns. Wind waves are generated by local winds and tend to be steeper and closer together. Swells are waves that have traveled from distant storms and are typically more rounded and further apart. Different wave types require different handling techniques. I'll never forget taking my family out on what started as a calm day, only to have the wind and swell pick up suddenly. What began as small ripples quickly became five-foot waves. By adjusting our angle of approach to about 45 degrees to the waves and zigzagging our way back instead of head-on, we turned a potentially miserable and dangerous ride into a manageable one, and kept Grandma comfortable. When approaching waves, the angle of approach is critical. Head-on, zero degrees, minimizes rolling but can cause pounding, best for short, steep waves. Quartering, approximately 45 degrees, reduces pounding while maintaining directional control, often the best compromise. Following seas, 180 degrees, waves from behind can push your stern around or cause surfing, requires careful speed control. For displacement hulls, wave timing can be effective, adjusting your speed to synchronize with the wave pattern. Essentially, time your pace to ride wave crests, ensuring a smoother ride, especially in swells on vintage boats whose hulls have taken a beating. For planing hulls, maintaining enough speed to stay on plane while adjusting trim to match conditions is usually most effective. In very rough conditions, however, slowing to displacement speed may be safer. Above all, respect the power of waves. Even relatively small waves contain enormous energy. When in doubt, slow down, secure loose items, and ensure everyone is wearing a life jacket. Water isn't always still. Currents, tides, and the movement of other vessels create forces that can dramatically affect your boat's behavior. When navigating in currents, remember that your boat responds to the water, not to the land. This means your actual course over ground will be the vector sum of your speed through the water and the current speed. I watched a novice boater try to cross a strong current at a 90-degree angle in the UK. He ended up nearly half a mile downstream from his intended landing spot. A simple adjustment, pointing his bow about 30 degrees upstream, would have given him a straight line crossing. In rivers, the fastest current is typically the deepest part of the channel. Outside bends have deeper water and stronger currents, while inside bends have slower water and often hidden shoals. Interaction effects occur when your boat passes near other vessels or fixed objects. Bank effect. When passing close to a shoreline, your boat may be drawn toward the bank. Passing effect. When passing another vessel, both boats may be drawn together. Squat. In shallow water, your boat may settle lower due to increased water velocity under the hull. True story. I once stood on a 50-meter yacht passing under a bridge in Florida. The captain didn't account for the interaction effect, and the boat was suddenly pulled sideways toward the bridge. Not even quick thinking and full throttle saved him from an incredibly expensive collision. Physics doesn't care about your experience level. It affects everyone equally. Currents steer your boat off course. Adjust your heading to master rivers and tides and let us know how you get on in the comments. Want to know a top captain tip? Wind can be tricky, but it can also be your best friend. Wind creates forces that affect your boat in ways that aren't always intuitive. Wind exerts pressure on your boat's superstructure, everything above the waterline. This creates windage that can push your boat sideways, affect steering, and complicate docking and anchoring. Years back, my first attempt at docking in a 20-knot crosswind was a humbling experience. I approached too slowly, and the wind pushed my bow completely off course. An onlooker shouted, More power! Cut the angle! He was right. I needed to tactically work with the physics of wind with proper technique, not fight against it. The amount of windage depends on wind speed. The force increases with the square of the wind speed, the profile area of your boat exposed to the wind, and the angle of the wind relative to your boat. When operating in wind, anticipate the wind's effect on your course and compensate accordingly, and even help it guide you onto a dock slowly. Nature's Auto Docking In crosswinds, expect your boat to drift downwind and adjust your approach angle. 
Be aware that wind can change dramatically near shorelines or structures. Remember that wind effects increase as your speed decreases. You can effectively use it as a free braking power. Wind combined with waves creates particularly challenging conditions. When wind opposes current or tide, it can create steeper, more dangerous waves. This is why areas like inlets can become treacherous in certain wind and tide combinations. Wind's a sneaky force. Use power and angles to dock your classic boat like a pro. Let us know if you prefer to dock wind against or following wind. Let's see who are the pros. An anchor doesn't primarily work by weight alone. Instead, it works by digging into the seabed and creating resistance against horizontal movement. This is why anchor design is so important. Different shapes are optimized for different bottom conditions. My friend learned this lesson the hard way during an overnight stay in an empty cove that seemed perfectly protected. He put out a 3 to 1 scope, thinking it was enough for the calm conditions. At 2 a.m., a surprise squall hit, and he dragged anchor across half the cove and took out some boys. Now he never uses less than 7 to 1, even on the calmest days. The key factors in anchoring physics are Holding power, the anchor's ability to resist horizontal pull. Scope, the ratio of road length to water depth. Road material, chain versus rope and their different properties. Bottom composition, sand, mud, rock, or vegetation. Scope is perhaps the most misunderstood aspect of anchoring. Many boaters don't use enough road, compromising their anchor's holding power. The physics is simple. The greater the scope, the more horizontal the pull on the anchor, allowing it to dig in rather than pull upward. The minimum recommended scope is 5 to 1 for calm conditions, 5 feet of road for every 1 foot of depth, increasing to 7 to 1 or even 10 to 1 in rough conditions. This means in 20 feet of water, you should let out 100 to 200 feet of road depending on conditions. Road material also matters. Chain is heavier than rope creating a catenary curve that helps keep the pull horizontal. It also resists abrasion against the bottom. Many boaters use a combination, chain at the anchor end with rope for the remainder. Bottom composition dramatically affects anchor performance. Sand. Most anchors perform well, providing good holding in medium to coarse sand. Mud. Requires anchors with greater surface area to prevent pulling through. Rock or coral. Challenging for all anchors, look for types that can hook onto outcroppings. Grass or weeds can prevent anchors from reaching the bottom, may require special designs. We've covered a lot of ground, or should I say a lot of water, from the basic principles of buoyancy to the physics of anchoring. I remember when I first started boating, I thought experience alone would make me a good captain. But after a few humbling moments and some dings here and there, I realized that understanding the why behind boat behavior was just as important as knowing the how. Understanding boat physics isn't just academic knowledge, it translates directly into practical benefits. Better fuel efficiency through proper loading and trimming, enhanced safety in challenging conditions, reduced wear and tear on your vessel greater confidence in your boating abilities and hence a lot more fun, more comfortable rides for you and your passengers. As you head out on your next boating adventure, take a moment to observe these forces in action. The more you connect theory with practice, the better boater you'll become. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into boat physics. If you found this information valuable, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share it with your fellow boaters. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the water.